wonderful. So we've got the confirmation. So today's webinar is around a very specific topic. We are going to try and understand the security landscape as we speak. Uh, the whole idea of how things are evolving is quite dynamic right now. Now, for a long time, we've been very used to the idea of working uh, from premise. And now there are a lot of uh, organizations around the world that have started working remotely. So that is the idea behind uh, today's session. That's the inspiration where we put, the, put this together, uh, the whole session together. So that being said, the webinar is being recorded. If you have any questions coming uh, up, please feel free to shoot your questions then and there. I'd be more than happy to take your questions. Alrighty, we have a few more folks joining in. We'll start off in less than a minute. Wonderful. Uh, today's session is around this very specific topic. I was just giving you a walkthrough on what are we going to be discussing. Risk assessment and mitigation is what we intend to do. Uh, the whole idea behind how things are right now is back in the day, things were quite straightforward. Things were quite easy. Users were working from their office. You had things under absolute control. Most of the times it was your network security that was of top priority. And over the years, you have very well understood what's what, what needs to be uh, given priority, what sort of tools should you be setting up, all of that was started. But now as we speak, there's one quantum shift. All of our users have started working remotely, especially in my case, personally, I've been working remotely for almost about the last 150 days. An entire organization where there are almost about 8,000 folks are working remotely. That is a massive challenge for the IT. Things have taken a very uh, different direction right now. With respect to empowering our users, that's on top priority. Likewise, getting to understand that your network security isn't just about securing your uh, Active Directory or your infrastructure. It's much more beyond that. We are talking about your users being the perimeter of your organization. Now, with the whole remote work, the idea right now has become to empower users to collaborate effectively. That being said, it requires a couple of collaboration apps. It could be Office 365 or it could be Microsoft Teams that you see the adoption going on sky high, 700% increase in adoption. Now, all these new identities are easy touch points and access points and entry points for the attackers who are out there just waiting for that one opportunity. Now, we're talking about users in your organization and these users are the weakest link in your security chain right now. Now, your perimeter has expanded across geographies and it is not not within a right perfect okay your perimeter ex has expanded beyond geography and not uh, within just your infrastructure so that being said what do we do do we trust our users do we set best practices for them do we notify them upon what are the best practices with respect to accesses with respect to files and folder permissions a whole deal right now so through today's webinar we are going to try and understand this one fact that our users are potential loopholes in your security right now and attackers are just waiting for that one opportunity to crack through your security now attackers can get quite nifty they're very uh, you know particular about getting hold of that one opportunity to crack through your system it could be your users who are working remotely from their home offices connected to their personal wi-fi's you understand that how difficult it is to monitor at that granularity. Now, it's not just your users bringing their own devices, but they're also bringing their own vulnerabilities along with them when they access your system. So what do you do? In fact, almost about a month back, Microsoft gave out this infographic. Now, if you see right here, it becomes quite obvious. Now, Active Directory has been out there for quite some time now, almost about two decades. In addition to that, now we're talking about going on the cloud, doing hybrid infrastructures, just so that we can get our users empowered for identity access 
all the data that was on prem now has been moved to one drive we speak to a lot of administrators who've done that already you now we're talking about a situation where identities are all over the place and it becomes very easy for an infiltrator to crack open into your network infiltrate and exfiltrate data that is the entire idea right here and in fact this infographic points out the exact same thing it becomes absolutely easy to crack through one of these accounts because there are so many touch points we're talking about business email compromise attacks we're talking about targeted attacks on office 365 we keep hearing that all the time it is quite surprising uh, that you know uh, organizations have moved at that pace in fact the whole fast tracking isn't like really advisable but then we had to scale up to meet the requirement we had to do what we had to do and in fact the homeland security the department of homeland security almost about a couple of months back they came out with best practices for this migration too so there is risk out there and that is quite obvious the whole idea of working remotely is definitely risky than it's supposed to be we're talking about domain admin credentials easily be, being compromised Compromised in less than two days, all it takes for an attacker is to crack through just one basic account. And trust me, with how our Active Directory is architectured, you do not even need privileged accounts to figure out who are critical accounts in your organization. With just basic read privileges, you would be able to find out who are the domain admins. You'd be able to do a lot more, do a complete recon with just a basic account. And even before you know, your security comes down, data starts being exfiltrated. And the worst part is we've been working with a lot of CISOs and CTOs and all of them have this one complaint that it's become absolutely impossible to pinpoint where the attack is initiating from. Now, why? Partly because of the fact that all of your users are also accessing your resources from different geographies, are also very difficult to predict in terms of general behavior, when they log in, what files do they access, what privileges do they request for. So it becomes absolutely easy for the attacker to be a needle in the haystack very difficult to spot. They go right under the radar. They do all the exfiltration. So one obvious thing right here that we need to take into account is the fact that it is going to take a long time to determine what is happening. The risk vector right now is very unpredictable. You cannot pinpoint. And my recommendation to you would be to start evaluating and considering the possibility that you are already under attack. Now, as we speak, we've seen data that proves the same point. In the UK, a lot of healthcare organizations have been victims of uh, ransomware, targeted ransomware, targeting on EHR, employ uh, health records, electronic health records, and PHI, right? All that they want is that one opportunity. And when they try to get hold of it, it becomes really difficult, not just to battle the whole cybersecurity issue, but also the business side of things, but also keeping the lights on. It becomes really difficult from that standpoint. And therefore, it is important that we start foolproofing our systems. We are talking about users, right? We were talking about ransomware and how uh, it's a problem. It starts with probably a simple phishing email. Now you must be wondering, how would our users fall prey for phishing emails? We've got the best rules in place, but think about it. Your users are operating from home. These are the same users who will click on an email that says do not open an attachment, download an attachment that says do not download. They can be socially engineered and the data also proves the same. Over the last couple of months, we've seen a spike, a tremendous spike in phishing attacks. And yes, all of them are COVID themed. It becomes absolutely simple for the attacker to make use of this opportunity and put your organization at risk by sending out emails that are COVID themed. Talk about a World Health Organization, talk about the CDC, sending out emails to them. In fact, here in India, about a month back, one of the biggest financial institutions in the country had a tough time defending one of these attacks. They claimed to give a reward or a compensation to all users, to all <clears throat> uh, citizens, a specific amount if they were to give their, fill out their data right here. It said it was the government, so on and so forth. So many people got inflicted. The problem is, it is not just personal data being lost by users themselves. But these are the same devices with which they're going to be accessing your corporate network too. Your users are bringing their own devices. And like I said, they're also bringing their own vulnerabilities along. So how do you pin this down? Where do you start working on? It becomes absolutely impossible to narrow down the source of these problems and therefore risk assessment becomes all the more difficult. And these attackers are quite nifty. They're well-trained. They 
are extremely good at the art of deception they know the business lingo or they make the best use of the opportunity that presents to it, uh, presents itself to them in this case covid and then get details and exfiltrate your users in fact a month back we were uh, talking about how organization users are falling prey for simple office 365 uh, you know attacks where Google Forms are used to fish and scam users. Now, come on, how do you go about explaining this to your users and let them know what are the best practices? So we put together a very simple list of action items right here. We'll start and understand how do we foolproof this? We're talking about figuring out what are the weak spots in your system as is. We'll go a little further and talk about what it essentially could be an indicator of compromise. Right. We are talking about risk assessment. And if you have an indicator of compromise, nothing better than that. We'll also understand what sort of log data should we be tracking and how exactly can we put it to our advantage? Can we put it to use to our advantage? We'll be talking about that correlating law logs, trying to build a story around what had happened. And especially when you're doing a root cause analysis, it definitely does come in handy. So we're talking about that too. We'll go a little further, talk about making a comprehensive list of risks that are in your network as we speak. So we try to detect weak spots. We try to detect activity patterns that are deviation, <clears throat> that are deviations. We talk about audit logs and what logs do we monitor? And yes, we are trying to put together a couple of obvious risk vectors out there in your organization. We don't stop right there. We also go one step further towards the very end of the webinar. I will be giving you action items to defend these risks that we are trying to assess in our network. So let's start with the first action item for the day, which is identifying weak spots. Now, when it comes to identification, you have enough data already, but it's just that it's all over the place. We need to start with a clear cut auditing mechanism that is of top priority. We'll need to be looking at telltale signs. I have a couple of ones listed right here with respect to someone in your organization or an exfiltrator trying to access these resources or users or accounts. We'll try to pinpoint them and pin them down in terms of their behavior, in terms of the activity that is going on right here and assess what is the risk right here. Uh, I have a couple of questions. A few of you are asking me if the webinar link will be made available. Yes, it will be made available. Just drop me a message. We'll get that sent over to you. Going a little further, we're talking about telltale signs, signs that you need to be potentially looking for when it comes to an organization and where things can go wrong. Easy pointers would be log on activity tracking. Now, this is my classic and most favorite way to start risk assessment. Now, you'd be surprised as to how much insights you derive if you just get the right log on activity monitoring tool, not from just a productivity standpoint, but also users trying to do strange things. Users trying to access certain files and folders in non business hours. That's a classic example of an amateur inside attacker. Now, what do you do right there? You'd be on top of the situation. You'd be able to defend your organization and also receive real time alerts. Look for solutions that do that. Now, that's just one bit of it. If you were to attack the entire activity with respect to log on both failure and success, there's a lot more that you can do right there. And we're talking about uh, putting together a simple mechanism to see what brute force attacks are. Now, if you can track log on activity, you can very much pinpoint a brute force attack too. In a while, I'll tell you how. And with respect to what happens with security principles in your organization, be it group membership changes, be it group policy objects, or critical stakeholders and their files and folder permissions being altered, or user account changes that are being made, when there are unusual behavior, you need to be notified. That's a telltale sign. Now you must be asking this question, Jay, how exactly will we be knowing what's unusual? And that's exactly where you'll be needing a user behavior analytics module in place. So to identify a simple risk, uh, such as a group membership change or a GPO, it might not be enough to just have auditing turned on. You'd want some bit of context to what is happening and why is it happening? Is it a first time change? Is it a high volume change? Is it a high velocity change? You would need to know that and having a UBA would make a difference. So through the session, I'd be talking about that too. And with respect to accounts, especially inactive accounts, always at every given point in time, 
my best recommendation to you would be to clean up inactive accounts just in case some policy in your organization requires you to retain those inactive dormant accounts, especially if they're ones with service accounts or ones with credentials or with privileges, you will need to have them accounted for. A tracking mechanism has to be there in place to check what sort of activity is going on right there. And you will need to receive a notification right when someone tries to access the, these dormant accounts. Now, there's a quick tip that I have right here. Now, dormant accounts basically are an attacker's sweet spot because usually they don't get monitored. And essentially, if it's an insider with that information, they are the ones who start those attacks with those dormant accounts. So what you could essentially do is kind of reverse engineer the whole scheme right here. What if you can set honeypots for your attackers? What if you can have accounts that pretend to look like or that, you know, be uh, in terms of the syntax, in terms of how their name look like an administrator account, the nomenclature for them. And they can be tracked and you can set a clear cut tracking on these dummy accounts that pretend to be the admin account. And when someone inside the organization is trying to access these accounts, you would be notified on who's got a malicious intent. Simple as that. Another recommendation, do not have your admin credentials as default change usernames, change passwords. Please do that regularly. Be as unpredictable as possible. That's an easy way to reduce risk on your privileged accounts. Along those lines, we'll follow up with file activity too. With respect to file integrity monitoring and file activity, while working remotely, it's become a big challenge, essentially because your users are requesting access left, right, center. They need access to these critical data for business continuity maybe. They need uh, access to files and folders in large volumes and they try to at times even copy that such data. So we'll be talking about that. So identifying risks can become easy if you kind of classify it in terms of behavior, in terms of quantum, in terms of velocity for files, data, accounts, and events. So these are the uh, recommendations that I have for you from an identification standpoint and where to look for in terms of <clears throat> potential spots for attackers. Yep. With respect to how do you go forward doing it, we've got an extensive mechanism that is monitoring and auditing. If you were to ask me what needs to be uh, audited and monitored, we've got workstations, domain controllers, databases, the endless list of cloud platforms that you've got, the new applications that you've configured for your users, network devices, anything and everything literally in your network. And this does not make any sense if you were to monitor all of them in silos and it would make absolute sense if you could correlate all the data from all these sources. That is the idea. So being able to not just stop right there and look at data instead if you can have insights on what is the riskiest activity. Now we're talking about risk assessment right here. If you can have top users who keep uh, getting themselves locked out, if you know specific accounts that keep using their admin privileges to make modifications to other user accounts, if you know activities of repetitive logon failures being initiated because of a specific reason from a specific password or logon activity that is happening at peak or changes that are being made to critical uh, attributes like passwords. So this is the kind of view that you need to have in terms of failure, in terms of success, in terms of which modifications are done, top modifications, and what are the activities by the user, the most done activities. So if you are looking at identifying and assessing risk, the easiest thing to do is to list top riskiest activities and have them as clear cut dashboards like the one that I'm showing you right here and get the job done. And also, if you have a very clear cut alerting mechanism, these dashboards work hand in hand with the alerting mechanism and let the right stakeholders be notified. That is the idea right here. So the first point, the action item for today's webinar has been identifying risk vectors across your organization. And what are the telltale signs that we need to look into? Now we'll go a little further and talk about detecting such behavior. We identified that and can we detect such behavior with respect to patterns? Now we are talking about a situation where blanket values are not going to help. I cannot 
have blanket values for something like let's say account lockout i cannot have blanket values let's say for repetitive log on failures now every user behaves differently and especially that they are working from different geographical locations different <clears throat> time zones maybe even it is important to understand that we start being very contextual to the whole detection right here so it makes absolute sense if we're able to spin point anomalous activities and get instant alerts it makes sense if we are able to do it on file folder accesses permission changes that's where all the risk lies and if we're able to correlate the whole damn thing it would be even better if you can track activities such as log on log off failure startups and shutdown screen savers and invokes why would you need all of this we use us access the systems via remote connections you would need to be on top of it to know what sorts of sessions are going on at any given point in time you should have complete control over who is accessing the vpn what are the firewall rules that are being modified such minute changes need to be observed and reported to you all the time i'll start with this favorite example of mine which is being able to monitor log on activity when you do monitor log on activity and when you try to spot anomalous behavior in log on activity you'd be surprised the kind of insights that you can detect if we're talking about a brute force attack let's say a brute force attack in terms of log on activity can be explained like this 100 repetitive log on failures happening in less than 1 minute followed by one successful log on and that account accesses a critical file server and then there's an installation of an application potentially a malware and then there are packets of data that are sent back and forth now if i had said this the other way around log on failures great there is probably a successful log on wonderful uh, this is a normal activity and then there are applications installed on certain servers okay again a normal activity and yes also data packets being sent back and forth absolutely normal so when you look at all these activities without the context it becomes absolutely impossible for you to pinpoint where the attack is initiating from you would not be able to isolate an attack unless you get context to these attacks and log on activity monitoring both success and failure log on activity monitoring with context can help you detect a, an attack like brute force this is just one example so is the case with remote desktop activity being fishy classic case island hopping now attackers do not want to stop they want to put your organization at mass, maximum possible risk and try to exfiltrate data and not leave any breadcrumbs behind or for that matter if they are doing leaving breadcrumbs behind they want to misguide you leave it all over the place so they try to just get the first hold and then they try to figure out where the domain admin is and it's already been established it's easy if you were to have basic privileges in active directory to find who the domain admin is and even before you know there are more accounts that get compromised by the time you can get on top of the system the domain admin is also compromised and the entire network security is done so we're talking about tracking and detecting lateral movement if you were to do it on a normal day it becomes difficult because you would not know which user is doing the hop we're talking about unusual counts of accesses to hosts for the first time from a specific ip maybe from a specific user then that is an alert that is uh, definitely an alert that you'd want to receive so we're trying to assess the risk criteria which is the uh, risk in terms of what is being accessed from where is it being accessed who is the one who's accessing and why is it risky in the first place so having a clear cut dashboard that tells you that can make a lot of difference it being at the time of the day being at the quantum of activity you have a clear notification and context to it that says there are users there's this specific user who works usually from let's say 10 am in the morning to 6 pm in the evening accessing your systems at 5 am in the morning and logging in on applications on file servers on accounts unusually so that is the kind of insight that you need to get so is the case with lateral movement one ip from where all this initiated and that risky access is done across hosts for the first time and that's something that you need to be notified right away being able to detect lateral movements and obviously these lateral movements are followed up by malware installations and they are followed by privilege abuse where they attackers try to put themselves in certain privileged groups or escalate their permissions and this makes a lot of difference in terms of how quickly can you respond to situation essentially if you had a very strong user behavior analytics module in place it would draw baselines for normal behavior for every single user you'd be able to track privilege abuse 
track installation of uh, malware, track accesses to files and folders for the first time in a large volume, and also track deviations in logon behavior. So user behavior analytics is what you should be looking at if you're looking at a strong risk uh, mitigation strategy. Along those lines, we've established that mod monitoring users is quite important. If you are an Active Directory organization, I've got a couple of event IDs that you'd want to be interested in. If you haven't turned on auditing, please do for at least these event IDs. They are straightforward event IDs for the ones that we've discussed already. Just a quick uh, overview for you, a snippet that you can quickly take. These are the event IDs for log on success and failure. Group membership modifications, critical event IDs, ones that are listed right here. Account lockouts, again, can be a great indicator of compromise. Now, just like how password policies are, we've got account lockouts. That's another measure of foolproofing against the tax. Now, there could be two angles to account lockouts. We're talking about a security angle and another angle where the user legitimately forgets their password. So being able to pinpoint whether was it a legitimate uh, failure to remember or was it an attack makes a lot of difference in identifying and differentiating from a false positive. Along those lines, having an account lockout analyzer will make a lot of difference. So take that into account as well. And when you're monitoring account lockouts, do understand the source of the account lockout. File integrity monitoring is something that you need to take into account. You got event IDs like 4663. If objects are accessed for the first time, if you have an alert set for this, you'd know and especially have this uh, turned on for critical files and folders with machine critical data, machine critical data in your organization. Now, when it comes to audit logs, this the beauty to it. Uh, there's tons of audit logs that get generated. So please do ensure that you have systems in place that can uh, archive these audit, audit logs and have them in place and not delete them and not let them go. So we're talking about audit logs that are erased in time. We're talking about systems like Office 365 having limitations to how much they can store, Active Directory as to how much they can store. So do look for tools that can go beyond that native limitation and help you keep a tab on your audit logs when you're trying to do a root cause analysis. You definitely need them. So that's again another tip. So understanding how audit log works is one part of it. Being able to archive them, being able to access them when you need it is another definitely important part. Even if audit logs get erased by your attacker, since you'd have a backup copy of it, you would be definitely saved. And so is the case with attackers trying to cover their trace. No matter how hard they try, if you were to have the practice that I've asked you to implement, you will have enough data and the attacker would have also left a breadcrumb right there pointing to them trying to clear the data. So you'd know which user is exactly trying to cover their tracks. So understanding audit logs in your organization is probably one of the most important parts of your risk assessment and mitigation strategy. I've given you a couple of events. I've got a list of 25 uh, events that you can potentially monitor while working remotely. So do reach out to me in case if you want to track those events too. Now, when it comes to building a strategy, especially with a list of risks, it starts with understanding what you're faced against. Now, it can be accidental because we're talking about humans. It can be accidental where they make some terrible modifications to configuration. It can be your users clicking on a malicious link and downloading a malware. It could be them accidentally exposing certain corporate data that is machine critical to the outside world. Human errors are quite obvious and quite possible. A major reason of a major reason of these uh, attacks that happen are because of one of your insiders forgetting to do something like that or keeping their credentials on or making them very available or having them written down on a piece of paper or having predictable passwords, endless reasons for human error to be a potential risk in your organization. Essentially, while you're working remotely, it becomes all the more extrapolated and exaggerated. So that's something that we need to take into consideration. Yes, obviously, cyber attacks that we need to get on top of. We've been talking about how to prevent against cyber attacks and mitigate potential risks all through and hardware failure is also a legit thing when it comes to risk assessment. So most of the time, a lot of us forget the fact that a strong disaster recovery plan has to be a central piece of your risk assessment and mitigation strategy. It's not just uh, cybersecurity criminals or your insiders making mistakes. Hardware, for all you know, can also malfunction. Potential data can be lost. So along those lines, I'm going to give you a quick rundown on what all should you be looking at and what all should you be monitoring with respect to uh, human error, with respect to 
cyber criminals and hardware and potential risks associated with all three. Now with respect to uh, human error, <coughs> Let's start with cyber criminals. We're talking about logon activity monitoring. So you would know exactly when logon was made on a member server. Logons were made on a workstation, which user, if you want to pinpoint, you can do it. You can check the last logon activity, local logon activity, the whole uh, plethora of logon activities happening across your systems, be it on prem or on cloud or not, on applications elsewhere, you will need to be uh, having systems to interconnect all of that and give you a context for logon activity to spot potential attacks. And if accounts are compromised, this is where you'd start doing your root cause analysis. So having a clear tracking mechanism for logon activity is absolutely important. Group modifications, again, it's important that you have suggestions coming in your way rather than going through the whole list. You would need to be notified on what are the top modifications, which ones are the critical groups and what modifications. So your system has to be smart enough to call out a change done to a critical group. So you will need to have such policies in place. If there were any recently modified critical groups, you need to be notified. If there were any extensions made to attributes, you need to be notified. Any groups that were undeleted, again, and that's again a challenge right there. Object history tracking, the whole thing around uh, group policies, objects, and changing uh, change auditing is quite important right here. If there are any members who are odd accessed or uh, added to those groups, you need to be notified too. And from a file integrity standpoint, we are talking about data loss prevention and data leak prevention. Now, as we speak, like I earlier pointed out, a lot of file and folder structures have been altered and they've been moved to the cloud. Uh, a big challenge right now with that happening is essentially the fact that it becomes easy for an insider to copy data through a thumb drive. Back in the day while you were on premise, it was absolutely difficult for an attacker to take control uh, of the situation like that because there were physical restrictions like not being able to bring a drive to work or not being able to copy, but now it becomes easy. So you will need to have policies that also monitor data that's being copied to devices, to pen drives, to thumb drives from your OneDrive, for example. That's somewhere you can look at. And along those lines, modifications that are done, integrity is also equally important. Files and folders that are being moved, ones that are being erased. And it, in terms of quantum, if there are large files that are being accessed for the first time, that is definitely also something that you need to look into, all right? Along those lines, we'll talk about logouts. We saw about file integrity. We saw how important it is to track log on, log off. And yes, lockouts. Lockouts can be a great indicator of compromise. We've established that. And if it's about lockouts, you will need to be able to analyze a lockout, figure out where the user account got locked out. Why did that happen? Is it a legitimate user uh, action or was it a cybersecurity attack? So having that analysis will give you a very clear competitive advantage. So we've kind of tried and established certain critical points around how do you go about analyzing your existing environment. We saw how user behavior analytics can help you pinpoint changes. We saw how establishing clear cut auditing policies on certain aspects of your uh, infrastructure can help you and how correlating them gives you such insights. We spoke about a couple of critical events that you need to monitor. And now we've been talking about what out of the box reports can you be leveraging Right. These are the critical aspects of uh, monitoring and reporting. Now, how do you, after figuring out and assessing the risk, patch those risks? That's the next question. So we're going to put together a simple strategy. The next part of the session, the last part of it is around how do you prevent all of this from uh, being a risk? Right. We'll start with something very simple, which is account lockout analysis and go a little further, talk about whole identity security, a little bit around foolproofing your systems and how do you prevent data from a ransomware attack? And yes, an automated incident response system, too. So we'll talk about how to go forward and patch these risks. The simplest one, the last case that we were discussing is uh, the classic case of account lockout. If you had a solution that can break that down break that silo down and let you know what exactly was the reason behind a lockout. Was it a stale credential? Was it a poor network drive mapping? Was it uh, expired service accounts? You will need to know whether was it a cyber problem, a security problem, or was it a logistical problem? And that will help you definitely resolve problems quicker, essentially account lockouts and reduce possible help desk calls too. Now we'll want to look at long-term solutions. My recommendation to you would be to implement a self-service solution that stops your users from giving you calls. They can be 
educated to self-serve themselves with respect to password resets and account unlocks. So look for solutions that do that. So this does not reduce the risk, but turns out when you are less burdened, it gives you more time to look at other things that are important. Also, in a way, it does reduce risks for account lockouts because locked out accounts can be dangerous and easy targets for attackers to get in the middle and try uh, you know, acting smart. So we need to have that fixed too. Along those lines of accounts and identity security, password policy is an active directory. They're 20 years old. There's not been a great upgrade uh, since the time it came out first. We have fine-grained password policies, but then they aren't as fine-grained as they're supposed to be. They're more like uh, spray and pray. Now we're talking about potential problems that are known to all of us potential risks out there with respect to accounts being compromised because they end up using weak passwords. And as of now, as to how situation is, a lot of users will be fatigued already and will be pushed to use weak passwords. Now, multiple user accounts, they can't really help it. They'd probably be setting words from dictionary or something as simple as I love you at one, two, three, which has been the most used password the last five years. I think if there's no change that is done to how we implement password security, it's going to be the password for the next five years too. So the existing policies don't really cater to common problems like dictionary attack, common problems like pattern attacks, common problems like password spray attack. What do you do? How do you stop users from using incremental password? How do you make it least predictable? So look for solutions that can strengthen your policies. Look for solutions that can sit on top of your existing identity provider and get that strength. And we're talking about stopping users from using any dictionary word. We're talking about stopping users from using consecutive passwords from <clears throat> the past by just incrementing a number, right? You, the users are very aware how to game your existing complexity requirements. So we will need to get ahead of them and stop them from doing anything of that sort. In fact, patterns making it very difficult for them to set predictable passwords. My all time recommendation would be a passphrase makes the entropy of your password a lot higher, making it very difficult for them to crack a simple recommendation, but ca can go a long way. So do have password policies strengthened for your system. That's another recommendation. Not just that, if you're looking at going a little beyond, you know, no matter how complex password policies are, if your users use the same passwords across platforms, if one of those accounts is compromised, it leads the attacker back to their corporate account. Have I been pawned is one such website that does a good job of aggregating all the compromised credentials from the past. They have a very updated database where they go all through the internet, scout for compromised accounts, compromised data breaches, data from that, and have that incorporated into a database with which we collaborate with, which uh, our tools work in tandem to stop any users from using a password that has ever been compromised. So if it's out there in the internet, your users can never use such a password because all of these attackers start right there with what's already available online and then they get going. So you can in improve your password policies that way too. patch the risk with passwords with stronger password policies. And another method, a simple method to avert your risks big time like a quantum jump would be to enable multi-factor authentication. A lot of uh, organizations out there, now that your workers or your users are working remotely, you can enable MFA on their mobile. You can do simple authentication methods like touch ID, face ID can get the job done. Or you can look at other complicated second factors based on which stakeholders we're talking about. Let's say your administrator account got compromised. Hypothetically, the password of the admin account got compromised because while working remotely, a lot of credential sharing is happening as we speak, right? So an admin account got compromised, the password got compromised, the attacker is trying to go forward with that specific password, but turns out the attacker is not able to proceed any further because there's this wall that prevents the attacker from moving any further, right? The attacker tries to enter the password, the attacker tries to log in, but then the attacker cannot proceed any further because there's a second factor right at the login uh, a wall that prevents the attacker from going forward. In this case, it is an email authentication that gets sent to the administrator's account. So 
there's literally no way of bypassing this. So it makes a lot of sense to have all your critical accounts tied in with multi-factor. And my recommendation is not just have MFA for your applications, have it for fundamental log on to your active directory, log on to their desktops, their endpoints, their workstations, have that enabled right at the log on can be a game changer in addition to MFA for the other applications too. Now, through and through, we've been trying to work to balance the whole idea of usability and security. Now, when we are trying to make things difficult for your users, there'd be definitely friction. So what we thought was look for solutions that can assess risk dynamically, draw baselines, use machine learning to its advantage, check if the user is who they're claiming to be. And if yes, if they check a lot of check boxes and their risk score is very low, right? They do not breach the threshold. You can give them easy access. On the other hand, on the contrary, if their risk score is pretty high based on from the geography where they're logging in, the network reputation of the IP address or the biometrics of the devices or first time accesses, you would be able to pinpoint uh, to the fact that if it's an anomalous user or an anomalous behavior for that specific user, you'd be able to do that at scale for every logon activity with which you'd be able to empower your authentication tool. Now we're talking about a system where you can potentially stop a user from going any further with excess or with extra layers of authentication just when your system realizes there's a mismatch in context. J, who's a user who accesses uh, uh, the network over VPN from let's say 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., all of a sudden there's an access at 3 a.m. That's a deviation. The geographical location is a deviation. Again, it's from Nigeria. We've got another uh, deviation, which is the endpoint from where the access is happening. So such factors get taken into account. Just a quick example. They get taken into account and then extra factors step into the picture and stop the users from going any further. So look for solutions, especially while working remotely, not just MFA. If your system can do contextual authentication or adaptive authentication, that would be a kick ass way to prevent any attack. Lateral movement can be a thing of the past. Password spray attacks, no problem because there's going to be any way another layer. So all sorts of attacks, majority of them can be prevented if you just had MFA or adaptive authentication in place. In spite of all of that, before you could implement this, some sort of attack already in your system that is going on a ransomware or uh, some sort of malware that's already been installed, you'd want to be double sure with this simple rule. I call it the three to one backup rule. So all critical machine critical data in your organization, please have a strong mechanism right there in your organization just to get uh, uh, ahead of the attackers, have the three to one rule in place, make three copies of all your machine critical data and have them saved in two different storage formats in addition. Now, when some, one goes wrong, you'd always have the backup copy in a different version of the format. So you'd be able to use that. And the best part is the last version has to be in a different geographical location altogether. So at any given point in time, all permutations and combinations taken into account, even if something goes wrong, you'll always have at least one copy from where you can restore. So ransomwares, though they encrypt your files and folders, so if you have enough backup copies, if you have the three to one rule in place, you shouldn't be worrying about an attack because data loss prevention is equally important, but not being damaged from a reputation standpoint or not being damaged from a business continuity standpoint is also important. So get on top of the situation and prevent data loss with a strong backup and recovery solution. Now, along those lines, it all boils down to having a clear cut disaster recovery plan. So risk assessment, once done, is followed up with a disaster recovery plan. Now a disaster recovery plan, most of the times a lot of us overlook a disaster recovery plan, consider it as an overhead and do not do it. But my point is do test your disaster recovery plans if you already have it, go through them, do mock drills, check if they fit the bill right now. And now a lot of things have changed. Your old disaster recovery plans aren't going to be helpful. Essentially, if you're doing a risk uh, mitigation, that's your ultimate aim. Your RTOs, RPOs are now different and you have a lot of dependency across your organization. You have many stakeholders who are involved in this process. So you will need to test and retest your disaster recovery plan to check if it accommodates SLAs rightly. If you potentially have a DRAS who, who you've subscribed to, uh, a disaster recovery as a service, a vendor with who you're working, you will need to state your terms clearly. Depends on what are your priorities, depends on where your mission critical data is stored, depends on doing mock drills to identify how quickly can you get back on your feet? How quickly can you patch that risk and 
<clears throat> be back doing business. That is the entire deal with a strong disaster recovery and a BDR plan. Right. So it's about being proactive all along about being reactive. Can you orchestrate? Can you automate disaster recovery and incident response? That's a big question that we got right now. It makes a lot of sense to start automating your disaster recovery. When something goes wrong, you will need to have systems that kick in and uh, save and does not essentially wait for an administrator to you know, uh, address the situation. So we're talking about multiple sources of errors here. It could be humans. It could be a hardware error, or it could be even cyber attacks, but on all these situations, you will need to have a very clear guidelines written. Your SLAs need to be cleared with respect to disaster. And if you can automate the whole, uh, process, nothing better than that. Look for such solutions that, uh, automate. Uh, copies of backups that do scheduled uh, backups across your systems configurations done right. So you will need to look at that as well from a risk standpoint. Besides that, with respect to threat response and incident response, there's a lot of uncertainty that is out there as we speak. If you can have a potentially uh, supercharged system that not just assesses these threats, but also can respond uh, to an incident, we have pre configured responses to almost about 200 different incidents upon uh, you know, the such an incident happening, what happens is our triggers are initiated, a workflow is uh, set up, things start rolling. And if the user has to be kicked out, they get kicked out. If they, the session has to be terminated, that happens. If a program has to be uninstalled, that happens too. So look for solutions that just don't assess risk, give you reports, but also give you that extra nudge, the time it takes for you to get to the situation. If it can uh, have or uh, act as first aid, nothing better than that. So through today's session, we've been talking about quite a few points only to understand that the landscape that we're talking about, the risk landscape is quite unpredictable. We are just getting into the whole idea of working remotely. I speak to a lot of CISOs and CTOs and a lot of them are telling me that chances of remote working being a full-time thing for a lot of organizations, major chunk of the workforce working remotely could be a potential future possibility. Now that being said, it does make a lot of sense to consider identity access management as your centerpiece for your uh, data security or data access governance or SIM solutions too. And all of them have to work hand in hand for you to get real time insights. A couple of strong recommendations from me today would be to understand that native tools fall short. No doubt about that. So have strong auditing systems in place, strong monitoring systems in place potentially have user behavior analytics to say, see and treat every user differently and have context to everything that they're doing. And in terms of mitigation, if you have multi-factor authentication and adaptive authentication, nothing cooler than that. Worst case, if all else fails, you've got the backup to help you out. Guys, thank you so much for being such a lovely audience. Today's session was on risk assessment and mitigation and a couple of takeaways for you from uh, Manage Engine. We are right here to answer your questions just in case if you have any, feel free to shoot. The webinar was recorded. If you want a copy, we'd be more than happy to help you. And in case if you have a request, specific requests around uh, the resources that we promised through the session, please let me know the 25 list event IDs that you need to track while working remotely or other resources that we put together around risk assessment and the frameworks that we've got. If you need any of them, just drop me a message or an email at jreddy at and I'd be more than happy to help. Lovely. Thank you so much, guys. Just one quick request. Do stay safe. And yes, I honestly hope the next time when we meet, we meet under better circumstances and I wish you all well. Thank you so much for being a lovely audience. Talk to you real soon. Thank you.